I hate it because it's a stupid sounding word. We're system operators. We're not a shortened something or other. We're, we're the people who are keeping the damn thing running. We're not sysops. I mean, I never called it system operator. It's just, it's not a system operator. It's a sysop. Oh, by the way, I say sysop, not sysop. So. Yeah, system operator, sysop. <laughs> if anybody's a linguist out there, you know, just forget it. That's the way I pronounce it. Thank you. Yeah, I must have said Sysop for years until I discovered I was being horrible, horribly gauche. <laughs> it was a big holy war back then. <laughs> I just, that's how I pronounce things. If I saw something with a Y, I would say Sysop. co -Sysop. Um, Why did you go with Sysop? I thought Sysop sounded too much like sissy. My friends and I always said whiz up. <laughs> I only say sis up for the benefit of normal people. <laughs> whiz up. Whiz up was better than sis up. I mean, yeah. come on. <laughs> Under a sort of mess of stuff. Is the old BBS exactly how it was, even missing the six key when I took it off the line. I don't like throwing things away. And look, it has floppies in them. Seems to be, it's exactly like it used to be, because that's a slot 6 drive 1, the, the boot disk for uh, T-Pro BBS. When was the last time you saw it? This? Uh, I, out of a box like this? Well, this box, it's from a monitor that I bought 10 years ago. I was sitting at lunch one day with my friend Mike at high school and uh, he was talking about this great new thing called a BBS. And um, I wasn't really popular in high school so I was like, what is this? I was really into the computers. And uh, he said, oh, you can talk to people through, through the computer. And I was like, no. He's like, yeah, come over. So I went over to his house and he started dialing up. A friend of mine said, hey, try this number. There's a way to communicate with people that involves this computer, and they're out there doing the same exact thing, yet they may not be local to you, they may be local to you, you may never meet them in person. This is totally cool. I can, like, interact with another machine. And at that moment, I was hooked. This is for me. I have to get in on this. I remember the first time I downloaded a program and installed it on my computer and ran it. That was amazing. Like, who would have thought you could install a program on your computer without putting a disc in it? When I'd pick up the phone and I'd be dialing on that hideous rotary dial phone to, you know, to finally get the number after hearing a busy signal for a couple hundred times, finally getting a ring, and then going, oh, and then connecting, and then seeing this, you know, this, this the logon prompt. <laughs> this adrenaline rush. All right, I'm getting on. You know, I dialed into that, and then on that message board, they had lists of other places you could dial into. And from that, you know, I started dialing in all over the place. The mystique was there. There was something alluring about just, you know, staying up nights. It was something you'd do at night. It wasn't something you'd really want to do during the day because, you know, everybody was up and you'd be bothered. But if you sat in front of the computer, 
Um, there was something special about calling someplace you had never called before, not knowing what to expect, logging in, exploring its menus, exploring the systems, trying to find the operator online and break into chat and talk to them about what the heck their system was about. The fact that you could get out there to California or, or Seattle or Maine or Boston and, you know, the, the minute it took you to dial a number, wait for a carrier and connect and just be in someone's house or store, wherever this thing was. So you like dial in and it's just, you hear the modem go, and it gets little noises and it's whistling and stuff. And you're on, bam, it's like, and there's no multitasking. It's like, that's all your computer does. So you're like, you've got the whole screen and you're there. It feels like you're going somewhere, like it's a place, like a journey. It's like, this is brilliant. This is amazing. This is fantastic. I can talk to somebody through a computer without seeing them. They don't have to see me. I don't have to see them. We just talk. You knew that someone said, oh, what do you do? Like, oh, I spent some time on BBSs. If you saw the light spark, you knew that was a person you could relate to. If you didn't, screw them. They weren't worth your time. I guess the system operator, you know, came out of the mainframe and the, the operators in, in a mainframe environment were people of, of humble stature, but great power. Um, and and the, the same held true of people who operated BBSs. I mean, you could do whatever you wanted. And I, I forget if it was because I was posting something or I was having trouble figuring my way around since it was my first time, but he broke into chat, which completely freaked me out because I don't even think at that time I understood there was a system operator, an individual running it out of his house. The sysop requests your, your presence and then you go into a split screen chat. And I remember the first time I had it, I was shocked. I didn't even know that could happen. Holy shit. He's trying to chat with me. What the hell's going on? And so this guy breaking into chat to basically berate me like, what are you doing? What are you, how are you doing it? What's, who are you? What are you doing? What's your handle? And I was afraid that I was taking too long just reading what he wrote. <laughs> it's very scary. For the longest time, when I was using other people's VUSs, I, I would write everything very carefully because I knew it was important not to say anything embarrassing and have to backspace it because the sysop would be watching. You kind of get this idea of what a system operator is. You try to chat with them and they're never there. They're like a cool person that's somewhere else. So I wanted to be a cool person. The sysop is, um, is the cool one that all the users want to get to know and they, they want to be like. Sysops were um, definitely um, treated quite well. There was there was a respect factor and then there were people that would, we would have um, BBS events and everyone would want to buy the, the system operator, um, all the beverages they wanted. Hey, you know, I, I actually know Jim. He's the sysop of, you know, such and such BBS. You know, all of a sudden you, you know, you, you sort of raised up in clout. You know, hey, I'm good friends with the sysop. People, like users, would look up to you like you knew, you knew a lot. <laughs> I mean, there, there is some, at, like, you know, God aspects to it because you can read all the private messages. I even got laid a few times because of the BBS over, you know, I'd meet a woman through the BBS. And it was like approaching Mecca the first time I saw where the bulletin board was actually running, you know, to actually log in at the console. I just thought that was the most amazing thing. There was one I played, and it was like Adventure, an online adventure game, and it was like a three or six line system. I was used to playing Adventure just by myself, and I remember playing this game and going into this little um, valley, and this it said, you know, this person has just, <laughs> you know, entered the valley, and I was like, this is awesome. And I didn't know what to do next. And you could say hello to the person. And he's like, oh, hello, Steve. I'm like, how do I get to the house? And he says to me, follow me. And I didn't really understand until it said, Frank just went west. <laughs> so I type in west and hit enter. And it says, you are on a path. Frank is here. And then it says, Frank just went east. <laughs> Only me and like a few other people knew what was going on because when I used to go back into work, they had no clue about, you know, these kind of things.
I looked at my phone bill and said, gosh, I'm downloading these programs, I'm downloading these files, I'm spending my time doing this, it's taking forever, and I'm, my bill is huge. Mm -hmm. Wait a minute, if I set up a bulletin board, people will send me files and I won't have to go after them. Right. I, I put the number out on some other boards, you know, and then I, I, I finally put it up live, and I left with my friends, and I came back around midnight or something as a 15-year-old kid, <laughs> staying out too late. And there was somebody on my bulletin board system. I woke up. It was it set up in my bedroom. And I woke up, and I'm just lying in bed, and my eyes opened, and I just, I saw the, the little light on the hard drive was flickering. And I saw them typing, typing messages, typing commands. I saw my, my floppy disk drive whirring. And I was just stunned that somebody was in control of my computer, and it wasn't me. And it occurred to me, I'm like, it dawned on me, somebody's using this now. This computer's not being wasted. I'm asleep, but someone's using it. And that I had set up this service, and that was just totally defining and empowering to me. Why we actually got into running boards in the first place is sort of a mystery. It just, it was appealing to, um, just to be in it, to be able to s present something of your own I know I'm being taken advantage of, I'm being used by someone using my equipment, but the idea that I created something that people are using. And then when I was in bed and at night and it was dark and the screen was turned off and I was just lying there and I could hear the hard drive chirping away and making its little music, I could tell exactly where people were on the board based on the notes and, and the sounds that it was making. I could tell what door game they were going into, whether they were reading a message or posting a message, you know, if they were just logging in or if they had just logged out. You know, I could just, I could follow their progress through the board just by the sounds the thing made. It was just, it was just a mind-blowing concept to me. They're in my bedroom right now with me. The thing about being a sysop was that you, you had this system, you designed it yourself, you set it up yourself, and while it was based on software, you had to do a lot of work yourself to get it working properly. I was always at my computer. If someone paged me, they would get me. Like if it was three o'clock in the morning, the computer was beside my bed, so I'd wake up and, and talk to them. Uh, I'd always answer my mail. I, I was always trying to make sure that I had the latest up-to-date file bases, new doors all the time, and that, that kind of stuff. I, I tried to keep people interested in the BBS. I think I just liked um, running something and seeing people using it and maintaining it and, you know, watching just the communications and... It, it, was, it, was just, it was a labor of love. It was amazing that these people would build these, uh, you know, these huge social systems on, you know, these tiny toy computers, you know, uh, with floppy disks. It was like the, the Wizard of Oz where there's a guy behind the curtain and those people never knew that there were two guys behind the curtains sitting there babysitting it monitoring it and they're requesting a file and we're out there trying to find the floppy disk that has that file on it before the session times out that we're flipping the disks in and we would go out there and we would we really wanted to try hard and we really did a good job on this little bitty insignificant thing and it's not this insignificant thing that was so important it's that we were proud of what we did so i'm immensely proud of what we did if you didn't have fun when you were doing it your site wasn't going to last more than three months because it you know the hardware's loud the phone connection's expensive, you're pouring cash into it. If you're not having fun with what you're doing, you're out of it. The person behind it, with the brains, behind the whole project in the broom closet, was a woman who was deaf. And she, consequently, she couldn't talk on the phone. And we set up, somebody gave me a modem, and I can't even remember what type it was. I mean, it was a very 300 baud. And um, I set it up so we could, she and I could talk. And she would call me or I would call her, and then you just sit there and type to each other. And that was the best thing since sliced bread for her. You know, she was just thrilled with that. Because this was the first time that she could actually hold the conversation over a telephone. So in 1987, she was the computer coordinator for the Worcester Public Schools. And I was one of the trainers. And uh, she read a lot. And she had found in some magazine that there was a company out of Florida called Galacticom. And Galacticom offered a multi-user bulletin board system, a BBS. Um, 
and they said if you know I think the price was six thousand dollars it came with 16 onboard modems and she came to me and said what do you think about this you know I, I can write a grant I have some or I have some grant money and uh, we could set something up like this well again I could see the potential of this and said wow you know this this could be really something but it was interesting because there would be groups that you would see and they would start, you know, at age 13 and they would be on maybe two or three years and then all of a sudden they'd disappear and there'd be a new group coming in. And we had some really quiet kids that just went kaflooey when, when they got on the, on the BBS and the teleconferencing area. There was a, a young boy on there that was very, very popular and he was like a freshman in high school. His father was one of the, was a teacher in the Worcester Public Schools. He retired recently. But this young fellow became very popular and then came down with cancer. Um, and he eventually died. He passed away. Um, and all the kids, of course, from all over went to his funeral and wake because they all knew him through this medium. His father asked me if I would go up to the hospital to visit him because he said he just wants to meet the sysop of the broom closet. And it was like, you know, a little momentary stardom, you know, but I remember going up and meeting him and, you know, and I just felt so bad because, I mean, he had the laptop there with him and everything, but I said, you know, I, you know, I know you're getting a lot out of this. And he says, oh, and he says, I'm so happy that you had this for my son. He says it really, really made his last days easy. And that, that was worth it right there, you know. At the end of the day, it's the sysop that is uh, the ultimate judge, jury, and executioner. It's the sysop who's the one who does the bans. It's the sysop who's the one who tells people, this is what you're going to do, and if you don't like it, get off my computer, get out of my phone lines. You were, you were the king or the queen or whatever of your own little kingdom. A bunch of them were very authoritarian and very, you know, you're, in, you're coming into my house. The, one of the most common, inane, naive arguments I hear from these, like, well, you know, engineer white guys, say, this bulletin board is in my house. I will not have any swear words on it. You know, a lot of sysops got this protective feeling about their users, you know, like they were my users. You were over here trying to steal my users, you know. That man put a, he swears, he said something I don't like, it's in my computer in my house. And it's like... Don't run a bulletin board. It's like, you know, it's like then banish, the, then if you don't like what the newspaper says, don't bring the newspaper into your freaking house. Oh, what's that guy doing over on your bulletin board? He's supposed to be on mine, you know? We must control all everyone's bad thoughts. Will, you know, I must not think bad thoughts. And if you're thinking bad thoughts, we'll stop you from thinking bad thoughts. Rather than just going what the Europeans have learned because they are tired of having blood-soaked rivers. A lot of those boards were run by adults. Um, and they seem to be run by particularly, like, anal retentive, uh, control freak adults who are, like, very specific about what can and cannot be done on this board! My old boyfriend, my first boyfriend, Andy, he would break into your message. He would bracket what he was saying <laughs> and write sysop, colon, and then he'd put in his commentary on what you were t working on in the moment! Oh, jeez! And then you'd keep writing, and he'd break in. When, when a sysop drags you into chat, right? you know, you're going along and all of a sudden the board starts doing stuff on its own that you didn't tell it to do. You're seeing commands get issued, you know, then you start hitting escape or trying to back up and they get reissued. <laughs> Next thing you know, you're suddenly in chat and the sysop's, you know, hi there. And you're like, ah, what did I do? You know, I had a lot of, um, I guess, control issues with my BBS. I would, uh, put the sysop screen up and start talking to somebody and if they were nice to me I gave them special access and if they weren't nice to me I would goodbye kick them off <laughs> and there were some people who you got to recognize and oops oh, yeah. unplugged <laughs> <laughs> sorry I don't know what happened but it must have reset you could do that I mean you could twit people you could you could torture them um. <laughs> if you act like a child or a teenager and that's how your book gonna end up. It's gonna end up wild and out of control. So, in a way, it teaches you kind of leadership skills. And now I never thought about that till now. Uh, and many people, you know, that's their power spot. You're at your desk, you're at your computer. This is my place. I've created my environment. This is my window to the world. And, and 
some of those people don't really want to get out and, you know. Flame wars have, you know, been throughout history of, of computing. Uh, when you have different people's opinions and they can instantly react at a keyboard, you get flame wars. One term we coined out here, I think, but it may have also been coined elsewhere at the same time, was 1200 baud misunderstanding. You don't have the feedback on keyboard communications, and so that <laughs> tends to amplify the flame uh, quotient. Somebody gets on and you start talking about this. Oh, you're a complete idiot. You didn't even do this, and like a T is not supposed to be capitalized. It's supposed to be this, and you must be the stupidest person in the world. You wouldn't say that to somebody if they were reading their paper next to him. You'd go like, I hey, should capitalize that T. And that's it. And he'd look at you and you'd go like, oh, you should help me out. Okay, capital T. Now, anything else? Some people just get a huge, just a joy out of, you know, flames. Well, I mean, we were fighting all the time. Um, that was half the fun of it. Good. When a person cuts loose like that, they've, they've peeled back all the layers. It gives you a good look inside. Mm -hmm. And you get to know that person a little bit better, whether you want to or not. Every board's going to have a couple of people that that just love to start a riot. Well, you'll see a fight between two people break out, and then you see the rest of the board come and, 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 and get in on that fight, and then you see the original two people just sort of bow out, and then it gets like, into this huge conversation. Well, you know, you go on there, and it was very childish, very like, uh, you know, pee-poo, just not piss, F you. In, in the old days, you'd have these pedantic arguments where people would just get a bug up their backside about you'd say, well, I've got a 2400 baud modem, and they'd say, well, that's not really correct, you know, because baud doesn't equal BPS, and they would just lecture you to the point of, you know, ready to put a gun in your mouth and pull the trigger because you couldn't take it anymore than from just the whole techno geek thing. So, yeah, it's a sysop, too. You have to be really careful to... Diplomatic. Uh, yeah, to settle things like that quickly, otherwise your message section gets torched. But eventually when it got to the point where too many people dropped, the, the sysop was worried about a lot of his good friends getting upset, or, or some of us who knew the sysops better would say, hey, you know, these guys are getting a little bit out of line. He'd cut them out. People had complete freedom to be jerks. And there were some people who just never were. And these people became my very close friends. Trade wars. Trade wars. That's another good one. Well, there's always Legend of the Red Dragon and Trade Wars 2002. And you go on the BBS and go, hey, cool, man, this is like free, free games. Trade Wars was one of the first multiplayer games where you could actually compete against each other, blow each other up in a safe, sane environment. Well, it was really the first large-scale multiplayer game that we had ever played. Oh, it's a it's a kick to play that game. That is a really fun, just raw strategy game. You could see other people who'd been on the board who'd been playing, but they're not on right now, right? So you just see their ship, and you could attack at a certain amount, and that was about it. And then wherever you were stuck, you were stuck, and you knew your ship was stuck there for a whole day. You know, you're interacting with real people, lots of real people, um, not in real time, but, uh, you know, once a day you could go and you could play your turns and, and you were doing, you were competing with all your friends, you were competing with a lot of strangers, you were trying to win. Every night at exactly midnight I go down, I'm dialing in and, you know, cruising around, sort of using all, taking, up all the, taking all the resources, kind of cleaning up on everything. Uh, and nobody else, as far as I could, apparently nobody else was doing this on his board, so. Every day, it would be, I can't not log in today, I'll fall behind, I'll lose out. So we'd have to call in to make sure that we could keep our ship alive. And that's really um, the key to enjoyable gaming for a lot of us, is playing real people. And once you got online and had played, all the more reasons to just talk. I had this weird idea that somehow it, uh... It was this pseudo semblance of real life, and uh, if I could apply the same methodologies that I was using to get a whole bunch of credits and get a really bitch ass ship, and do really well and own everything, that hey, if I can do that in this little game that everybody else gets killed in, 
um, I'll have a nice car someday and a really cool job. The concept of starting uh, a bulletin board as a social connection point for gay people seemed like a pretty neat idea. And my mom had just died and left me a few thousand dollars and I was looking for something noble to do it with and uh, so I thought starting a gay bulletin board might be a neat, a neat idea. And as it turned out, it was. I mean, it, uh, it spread like wildfire here locally and it was the way to, to, to connect uh, with other gay people for many, many years. Even that short time ago, in 1986, uh, there were an awful lot of isolated gay people, even in as huge a community as Washington, D.C., who just were so closeted and so inexperienced and so afraid to ask anybody else uh, anything at all about it that I became the person who was accessible and, and was the guy that, that, that they said, you know, that they thanked me just over and over and over again for creating this capability for them to meet other people like them. Many of our, our early members told me, in no uncertain terms, I didn't know that there were other people around that were gay. I, I've lived my life thinking I was the only person like this. And it was such a revelation for me to find a bulletin board where there are hundreds of other people who, who, are, who, are, who are just like me. I never had any idea. At the login process, there was always the opportunity to send a message to the sysop. Right. even by total strangers who couldn't log in. And those are the death threats I got. Those are when the 12-year-olds logged in, and time after time. I, <laughs> one of the things I did one year, I collected about a dozen of these death threats, and I mailed it out in our annual fundraising letter to our members, and quoted them, and said, these are the death threats that your sysop got during the last year. This is what we're trying to do for you. You know, I just want you to, to get an idea of what the real world is like. It was one of the best fundraising letters, one of the most successful letters we ever sent. And I, I've thought many times since we really stuck it to those people who, who, who thought they were going to make it difficult for me. I used them. <laughs> it worked. <laughs> Remember in the beginning, too, people talked about they were afraid that the BBSs were going to be, you were going to be sitting there and not communicating with other, you know, with other people. I found it quite to the contrary. Uh, for years, for several years, um, I, was, I was going every Friday night uh, to this 24-hour coffee shop and hanging out with lots and lots of other BBSers. Like every weekend there would be, some BBS would be having a get-together party. Right. Um, and, and people would be getting together and actually doing stuff together in real life. The BBS meetings was probably one of the biggest attractors for everybody. We used to advertise them for a month at least. In Even there were the meetings were on all the BBSs together. So, or sometimes there were particular meetings, for example, for a fundraiser for my BBS, Nopal BBS, or a fundraiser for another BBS. From the time I was uh, I don't know, 15 or 16 on, I went to pub night for the Pinnacle Club, <laughs> later to Mound 7, pretty much every week. It was weird if I didn't go, and that was quite a trek to go, because it was in a different city, and I didn't drive most of the time. Damn, it was, it was just a great social group, and I loved it. Uh, at midnight, everybody had to go outside at the party, grab a bottle of beer, and just pour it over your head. You know, it's one of those initiations that you do when you're 16, 17 years old, so... Um, you mean while it's cold? Oh, barefoot in the snow, full bottle of beer over your head at 12 o'clock midnight. Of course, all these PPS girlfriends and boyfriends that came up, for example, my brother, he was probably he was 14 at the time, he was chatting with his 12 year old. And there was all this hype, all the BBSs knew that they were going to meet in this party. So my brother got drunk in the party, his first time he got drunk, 14 years old. In the party that he meets this girl, which, by the way, was not very good looking for his taste, so he was not very interested in her and whatever. I mean, we, you know, we, we caused many, many a divorce. We caused many a people to break up. 
you can't even put a number on how many affairs were you know happened off off of our system and there was a uh, you know quite a few success stories of people that got together that met each other on there and are still married today okay i met my first girlfriend on diverse uh, at a diversity party oh god that's where i met her wasn't it it was actually how i met my wife and i've been married to her for eight years and we got two kids all you know all because of the Baltimore, we were the social scene of Bakersfield. I used to be so embarrassed for years about admitting how I really met him. But now, with the internet being so popular and people admitting on that all the time, I'm not so embarrassed by it anymore. She had called my BBS and uh, I was chatting with her, trying to get her to just, just to meet her. And she didn't want anything to do with me. So uh, eventually she came to uh, um, one of the BBS meetings that we were having regularly and met her there and you know she, she was going to the meetings and I was going to the meetings and she only lived you know right down the street from me so I started to pick her up and take her and you know a few months later we started going out and, and that was almost almost nine years ago. A friend of mine was grabbing me and pulling me out of the house to to get out right and to get away from him. Just then my chop beeper went off on the on the bulletin board system. I looked over and there was Sierra. So like, ah, just give me five minutes. Pop in a chat. Four hours later, I had a date the next day, or you know, we're meeting for uh, for lunch at McDonald's. I think a few months later we moved in together, and then here we are, like thirteen years later, and married. I think it was pure luck, and maybe fate or something, because it seems highly improbable that we would have gotten together under normal circumstances. Don't you think? Yeah. There's the age difference. Are you aware of that? No. Oh, well. <laughs> I was 23. 24. Going on 24. Yeah, right. I was 40. Or 39 going on 40. I don't know. Yeah. We're 16 years apart. So, you know, we already had rapport communicating on the bulletin board before I found out the difference in our ages. If I'd known the difference in our ages, I don't think I ever would have really seriously considered... Uh, a romantic relationship with them just because, you know, just because. But then by the time I found that, I was like, oh, oh well, well, <laughs> it didn't really matter. The perception of BBS was geek toy. You had to be a geek. And believe me, there were very few women into BBSs because they were geeky enough. Uh, they didn't see, you know, the sense of sitting at the keyboard when they could just call their girlfriend on the telephone. Yeah, socially it changed because all of a sudden, there were girls. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it was like amazing to have a female member on your BBS. We, being me and my best friend, it's just like we got like tons and tons and tons of attention, but we took it for granted. It took us a really long time to realize Oh, it's because we're the only chicks. <laughs> oh, there's two others, but one's 40 and one's like 90. <laughs> but I yeah. never flirted for access. No. I'm just friendly. And I think let good. me tell you, if you're a girl online and you're friendly, people fall in love with you. And that's all you need to do. Oh, yeah. And they got into this argument over all it took was a female name. And if the person could pull it off, within two weeks, every male on the board would hit on her. And and Ben was arguing, oh, no, 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 that's not going to happen. And so VCXE created this female persona, logged in as a new user, and played it for months. I would be signing up, and I would enter that I was female, and then suddenly I'd be in chat mode. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yeah. The sysop is breaking into chat. <laughs> uh, Type F again. Yeah, yeah. That turns me on. <laughs> <laughs> if we got like dissed by somebody, then we would show up as another girl with or another two girls with other names and like be all like, uh, uh you know, like what are you gonna say? Like, I think you type cute. <laughs> But, like, in whatever way that you let people think that maybe you have some kind of interest in them. Maybe it's the way that they run their board. It's so smooth, and they're always available to chat. <laughs> it's sort of like, why would a model be calling this BBS in Seattle? <laughs> That's what I mean. That's 
<laughs> interesting. But they fell for it hook, line, and sinker. And he had, um, you know, a log, essentially, he'd written down. And every single male user of that BBS had hit on him at least once in that three-month period of time. And people would always be sending me emails, but um, it wasn't something that I... Well, maybe I did have, maybe I did have fun with it. <laughs> <laughs> I had daydreams that I would meet like another female sysop, and we'd form this super elite female hacking group and just kick everybody's butts. I mean, I was I would totally been open for that. And not only that, but it'd be like, my God, like another girl to like just share stuff with, to share the problems of being female and being the only sysop and the the stigma that's automatically attached to it. I think that gender and sex are very often, well, they pretty much are always linked together, but I feel that gender is on a sliding scale and that somebody, when they see my physical body, they, they draw conclusions about me that are not correct. For me, BBSs were about community. Because I didn't talk to people in school, I talked to people on BBSs. These were people, again, within my, my little circle, my little city, my little high school region, my little school district region. It's no different than small town if you think about it. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, you know, that's what I was thinking. Even at the time I'm going, oh my goodness, you know, we're all like a little itty bitty town and we've all grown up together and everybody knows everybody. Mm -hmm. And so of course everybody knows when someone else picked their nose. <laughs> A bulletin board system, and the sysop, the sysop was female. Uh, she was married uh, with kids and whatnot. Unfortunately, what happened is she had an affair with, you know, one of the guys in the BBS system. That came out pretty, pretty fast somehow, and her husband, uh, to say, was upset was, you know, the understatement of the century. I still remember getting a phone call. It was about 1, 1 in the morning, and uh, I was getting picked up. So uh, a couple of friends came over one thirty in the morning, 2 o'clock in the morning, picked me up, and we went to her house uh, because it was a very, very bad scene. We're talking about things flying in the air, you know, the whole nine yards, and ended up, sh there was about 30 people who ended up showing up. And, you know, quite a few people holding him back, quite a few people holding her back, and quite a few people taking the, you know, the, the guy from the BBS out of the scene <laughs> and, uh, and packing up her stuff and, and putting it into a car and taking her to a, friend's mine, uh, a friend of mine's place to, uh, to stay there for about a week. One guy dropped his bike over in Maryland one night and uh, knew that he happened to be near somebody else's house who was a member of the board and got in touch with him and you know that guy got up at three in the morning and hooked up his trailer and they went out and got this guy's bike and so stuff like when I heard about stuff like that that happened that was pretty cool that people felt enough of a sense of attachment to one another that, that they would do stuff like that. You know, in the old days of PBS's if one member had a problem everybody had a problem. Uh, one guy was uh, going through a rough time, it wasn't unusual for half the members of the board to show up on his doorstep uh, bringing food and drink and music and let's throw a party and cheer you up. Most of, most of the friends I have now are the people I met through the BBSs, so that, that part of it, you know, that social part of it is still there. And there are people that I remember getting on our board that were 12 years old and they're having kids today, you know. it's. It almost feel you almost feel kind of like a, a father figure in some way to watch these people grow up and you help shape them and you saw the things they went through on the board as a teenager you know, they were battling drugs or they wanted you know they considered suicide because they thought nobody liked them and this and that and see the people pull together and, and really raise these people and turn them out to be you know decent human beings is really something neat Matthew how many memorial services, how many door sign memorial services have you been to in the last four or five years? Way too many. But that's, that's the power of the door side community. We lose a user, we lose, we lose someone. And it's like, hey, this is what happened, memorial services are, we go. Uh, 
we're there. I got sober through the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. I found the recovery message base when I was two, two weeks sober. And I was ecstatic to find it because I was more com I was so comfortable online. I could share online stuff that I didn't have courage enough to say out loud in a room of people. I could type it to a monitor. And those people saved my life. They loved me in spite of how nuts I was. And I was nuts. On a fight, on a big fight on Net Echo, you could get a thousand messages a day and you, who could read everything? In the recovery echoes, you read everything. You got to know people. Um, you got to care about them. One time, Somebody called Promises and didn't know anything about AA. Just knew that she couldn't not drink when she wanted to not drink. And we talked and I helped her found it, find a meeting near her house. She told me she was going to it and she never called again. And you multiply that by a whole lot of times. Um, it was it was a service. It was a being of service. It was a way to give back, and it was it was a gift. It enriched my life. The thing for me that I really would like to get across is how much fun I was having at that point for a wide variety of reasons. If I want to burn the bird, I want to be in this house, I want to have kids, I want I mean, it, it became my future, sure. It was funny because I had a little wish list that I used to keep on the side of my wall in my bedroom, you know, and I used to have things like I want a mini bike and I want this and I want that and I want a new Mac and I always had a new phone line and I always had my wish list and to this day I, that's the only thing that's probably not crossed off. I think I ran the best BBS there was. Yeah, people laugh about being able to read the modem lines, but I could. I could tell, you know, when which two people were chatting with each other or if they were downloading what protocol they were using, stuff like that. <laughs> I had an old man that used to call me uh, once a day and play chess. He'd make a move and I'd make a move. And it was great. I had, uh, I had a user who was in his 60s, it was a grandfather, and he wrote me some feedback saying it was great being on your board. I have my grandson here with me and we're on your board playing games and just want to let you know we're having a great time. And that, that meant more to me than anything. Yeah, in a way now it's kind of sad that you know it's no longer special we don't have that 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 special notion of poof you know you're you're a person who can go into the room where the computer is in a way it's but we've won <laughs> you know we've won now everybody is using the computer and the jocks are using computers too so they can find out what the football scores are <laughs>